Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my guest is Professor Eric Kaufman. He's a professor of politics at Burbeck College, uh, University of London. He's also an author of multiple books. One from 2018, 2019 was White Shift, Immigration, Populism, and the Future of White Majorities. He did one called Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth in 2010, The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America 2004, The Orange Order 2007, and others. And a new one is coming on the culture wars. So I think Eric's got a lot to say, and I'm glad you're here, Eric. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me. Well, if you would, tell me a bit about your background and how did you, what gave you the urge to author these books and to explore the topics that you've been exploring? Well, yeah, I'm Canadian, but I grew up around the world. My dad was in the, uh, more or less the Canadian Embassy Foreign Service. So I was born in Hong Kong, actually. Spent eight years of my life in Tokyo. I grew up in Vancouver. Then I've been in, in England for something like 25 years as an academic. So when I was, you know, when you grow up abroad, I think you're just much more in, aware of things like national identity compared to if you just grew up within a country, it's more abstract. So so I, that kind of got me interested in issues of national identity. I also have a kind of ethnically mixed background and so also an interest in questions of ethnicity. And Vancouver, where I'm from, like many North American immigrant gateway cities, ha has a lot of demographic shifting. So that too uh, played into perhaps my interest because I grew up there and spent much of my sort of teenage years there. And then how did you get into, um, I mean, let's start with your most current book. This is how it's quite out yet, but it talks about the culture wars. Let's talk about that. What prompted you to write about it, and what's the theme or the thrust of the book? Well, I mean, basically, I've had a long-standing interest in the intersection of three areas. I mean, one is population shifts, the other is uh, national or majority group identity, and the third is, is ideological shifts, particularly left on the left. And that formed my first book. So I was interested in, you know, the decline of the WASP in the United States and what led to shifts in immigration laws, teaching of history, and so on. And that very much was a story of shifts within liberalism. Now, if we come through to the, and that was also part of the story of the populist backlash was about, partly about sort of liberal limits, kind of upper window limits on discussion about restricting immigration, and therefore populists were the ones who were the only ones willing to talk about that and to campaign on that. So in both those cases, in both those books, that was a common thread, this interplay between, I guess you 
think about as nationalism on the one hand and a kind of anti-nationalist left liberalism on the other. And I think what's happened is that sort of cultural left liberal ideology has continued to evolve, has continued to be taken to new levels. And I think this is what we see with the rise of what some people would call wokeness or what would, what I would call cultural socialism, and then the backlash to that, which has sort of really two aspects. One's around speech boundaries, free speech, cancel culture, objective truth, this kind of thing. And then the other is around national identity. And this would be statues, rewriting history, critical race theory, so in that kind of uh, debate. And so, yeah, I'm just quite interested in, in this topic. And so I'm just in this new book really focusing a lot on the ideological shifts within the cultural left and the backlash to those. When do you perceive that this happened or started to happen and, and why has this come about? Well, what it is, is if we see this within the longer scope of Western ideas, it's it's an evolution of three strands, really. One is a sort of individualist, lib expressive individualist liberalism. The second is a, a humanitarianism, which bleeds into a kind of psychotherapeutic emotional fragility narrative. So that it's sort of beginning in the 60s in a way. And then the third is egalitarianism, which becomes more focused on identity rather than class and economics, particularly in the from the mid-1960s onward. And these sort of strands come together, even though they have these longer roots going back to the early mid-19th century. They kind of very much accelerate from the mid-1960s, and we get the rise of taboo around racism, which is maybe a good thing, but then on the other hand, it's not bounded. So what racism is, is not well defined. And so this can be stretched to cover something like saying, I don't notice race or anyone can make it in America or, you know, or it can be transposed onto other identity groups such as trans or such as women or, you know, so we have this kind of expansion in concept creep or mission creep in these taboos, which then starts to come into conflict with obviously, freedom of speech, for example. And so we have the speech code movement uh, starting in the 70s, but really taking off in the late 80s. And then we also have revisionist history, critical race theory, critical legal theory beginning, really, I'd argue, by the late 60s and, and again, expanding through the 70s and 80s. And so that's really the origin of this. Uh, it's a kind of compound ideology. I think of it as it's almost like you take the, uh, the cartridge from economic socialism, you Pl unplug it from the materialist console and you plug it into the, the liberal console, which had always been focused more on these identity groups. And that kind of gives us the hybrid ideology, which is really what, what we're dealing with now. Well, I don't know. It seems like it, this was confined maybe to the universities or kind of below notice, and it, it seems to have exploded onto the scene the past couple of years. What do you think constituted the turning point where now it uh, seems to be in the news quite a bit? Yeah, you can definitely track that in, and I do that a lot in the book, in big data content analyses of academic abstracts and, and news articles. What you see is actually that there was a lot of academic writing on, for example, if we take racism, sexism, homophobia, those were heavily being researched in this sort of 80s and 90s already in academic articles. What happens is about the 2010s, the early 2010s, we suddenly see coverage in the media of some of these concepts like systemic racism or white supremacy or racism converge in frequency with what we're seeing in academia. So something sort of allows these ideas to break off campus in the 2010s into the media. And that's really down to a couple of things. One is the expansion of social media, which allows academics and journalists to mix more easily, share ideas more easily, but also a real shift in the media model away from classified ad based revenue generation to clickbait and more partisan online journalism. And, you know, Ezra Klein talks about that in his book, Why We're Both Polarized, and also Bacha uh, Lugar Sargon's book, Bad News. And so what you get is a real shift in the media landscape, much more partisan, much more opinionated, and a new generation also, to some degree, coming out of the universities and social media, and that co out of that cocktail, and then you get Trump, in, of course, in 2015, 16. Out of that cocktail, you really get the spread off campus of these ideas. Okay, so are you tracking the trajectory of these ideas? Like, do they have one in your estimation? And where is it going? Where are some of these ideas going as of now, you know, uh, September 2023? So we can track uh, a number of 
quantitative indicators such as the number of academics that are targeted for firing, a number of no platformings, mentions of so-called social justice terms such as white supremacy um, in the media. And what you see is a kind of peaking around 2021 thereabouts. It's gone down a little bit since that peak of 2020, 21, sort of George Floyd moment through to about 2021 is, is sort of the high watermark of the energy of this movement. But I think it would be a mistake to argue that it's going away. I think what's happened, and we've seen this in the past, in the late 60s and the, in the late 80s, early 90s with political correctness. There's a sort of peaking, a falling back a little bit, but then a consolidation. And that's sort of how I'd expect it to occur this time around. Uh, because the other thing we're seeing, of course, is that the young population is much more favorable to these ideas than older people. And that's even, let's say we compare a, a leftist, you know, even a far leftist over age 50 with a far leftist under age 25. There's a huge difference in their toleration of freedom of speech. Uh, for example, support for Google's five Firing of James Damore amongst those under 25 is roughly two thirds of the under 25 support Google firing. I mean, of those who have an opinion compared to only about 30 percent, 25, 30 percent amongst the over 55. So we, we've got a big generational, a generational youth quake that's coming through that I think will push these ideas into their workplaces. We've already seen that a little bit with what happened at the New York Times, for example, over the Tom Cotton editorial. We've we've seen it also in corporations. And I think we're going to continue to you see it in schools. You know, certain speakers, they protest and, you know, say we don't want them there. I mean, they're, you know, seeing it in quite a few places, it seems like, right? Schools also with uh, DEI, diversity training in organizations as well. And, you know, there's an argument. Chris Rufo uh, has a book out recently called America's Cultural Revolution, where he argues that the ideas of Black Panther radicalism and the weather underground radicalism from the late 60s have become sort of repackaged through academia in the interim and emerged as the ideology of the Black Lives Matter movement and Antifa. And I think there's some truth to that. But I suppose my the argument I make is that it's more I see it more as, a, as what what occurs is this sort of desire of well-meaning left liberals to placate, you know, people who make complaints and that there's a sort of evolutionary incremental process whereby these sort of largely left liberal humanitarian types gradually move the needle to the point where they're converging with the radicals. And so I think that's my argument is that actually it's this gradual morphing. If you think about a, a shift from using a term like Chicano to Hispanic to Latino to Latinx, you know, these, these sorts of evolution, evolutionary shifts within terms, that's not really driven, I don't think, by a sort of march through the institutions of cultural Marxism. I think it's much more of a, a steady evolution of taking it to the next level of this ideology, which I call cultural socialism, but really is driven by left liberal rather than radical intellectuals. You think this is all organic or is it being fed by certain interest groups? Yeah, I, I'm in my the way I theorize this is sort of a, along the lines of Max Weber, who sort of you know the ideas, the prestige ideas, kind of come first, and then the status considerations, the self interest considerations, power considerations, kind of follow in their wake. So once these are the prestige ideals, then corporations will herd behind them, then diversity training firms will come in behind them as well and give them a certain degree of prestige, which will attract other people towards them as well. But I think, so the driver, I think the intellectual shifts come first and all of the sort of self-interested behavior comes second. But I think the ideological evolution I would see as very much an incremental step-by-step -step change so that, for example, the concept creep in the meaning of bullying and harassment, emotional trauma, and these terms come to be expanded and expanded to mean almost something like having a bad day becomes trauma or being offended becomes feeling emotionally unsafe. You know, so these kinds of expansions of the meanings of terms like racism, harassment, etc., I think is evolutionary and incremental, but has sort of then converges with the, the radical revolutionary doctrines of, let's say, an Antifa or Black Panther what I've noticed is, uh, you know, I'm surprised that corporate have taken up some of these ideas, but it seems like a light switch. You know, they take them up, they talk about them, and then bloop, they stop talking about them and they move on to something else, which makes me feel like they don't really care. They're just doing it to look good. And when another concept comes along, they're like, all right, let's switch to that. What's your thoughts and your observations? Well, my observations would be that they've been doing the diversity sensitivity training the equity 
minority, you know, affirmative action, all of that. Now, granted, there are certain legal injunctions and compliance, legal compliance issues, but still, they've been doing quite enthusiastically since the 70s. Now, it's gone up. The sort of amplitude has increased, but and, and this is covered to some degree in books like Chris Caldwell's Age of Entitlement and Richard Hanania's new book on the origins of woke. But there has been this ratcheting effect where organizations have been into this stuff for decades and decades. Now, it may have gotten a little crazier recently, but, you know, if you go back to even if you go back to the 90s and, and early 2000s if, and look at the, the content of diversity training, the ethos behind it was more or less to say, well, all groups should have equal outcomes. And if they don't, there's a kind of systemic racism going on. May not have used exactly those terms, but I think those are quite radical ideas and they were already there. So I don't, even though corporations may have cut back on their DEI, I don't think the virtue signal, and I think this virtue signaling is important. Um, so Shelby Steele's book, White Guilt, uh, talks a lot about this. In a way, you can think of affirmative action as a kind of virtue signaling to say, we have moral authority. We are the good you know, the good institutions, we aren't like the bad institutions. And so, yeah, I think this culture has been with us for decades, and I think it's going to continue to be with us, even if the extreme lets up a little bit. I mean, do you think that do these ideas have merit? Are they inherently destructive? Like what's, I don't know, what's a way to put it maybe with uh, your observation more than your opinion? Like where is all this stuff going? Is it cyclical? Is it a pendulum-like effect? Like what, what do you see for the next maybe five, ten years? I don't, I think it's kind of both directional and cyclical. So it's a bit like you have a rising wave. So we, we've we gone up. There's a wavelet, which occurred in 2020, 2021, where we hit the peak of that. We've come back down from that. But the swell is one that's rising. And I, I think similarly, if you look, for example, at the use of a term like racism, you know, it kind of, there's a spurt in the late 60s, falls back a little bit, but at a higher level. There's another spurt in the late 80s, early 90s, falls back, but again, at a higher level. And there's another spurt in the 2010s, and we've seen it come back down a little bit, but at a higher level. So I think I see this as a generally rising trajectory, and that's very much clear if we look at the opinions of, of young people who are likely to be the median voter and the median employee in the in 20 years. Now, do, do they have merit? I think my own view is I'm quite negative on these ideas. I think that they are... Now, of course, humanitarianism... You know, wanting groups to have more equal outcomes by gender, by race, etc., is, I think, a good thing. I think it's all, it has to be based on equal opportunity plus trying to raise up the weak rather than trying to level down the successful and the strong, I think is, uh, so I think there's kind of a, it's a bit like economics where there's a clash between equity and efficiency, the equity efficiency trade off in economics, where, you know, the more you have a desire to engineer equality, the less economic growth you have. But you can't just have maximize economic growth and not pay any attention to equality. You have to do some re redistribution. And so I think similarly in culture, you know, what we have now is a kind of cultural socialism, which says there must be perfect equality on lines of race and gender for any desirable position and any words that might be experienced as harmful by the most sensitive member of any any protected group therefore means the speech has to be suppressed so that's kind of a, what i would consider a very extreme position but it's becoming orthodoxy in many organizations and what i think needs to happen is a sort of dialing back of that extremism just the way we sort of dialed back on economic socialist extremism we need to find a an accommodation between cultural socialism and cultural flourishing, the kind of cultural flourishing which says there are other values besides equity. We've got to think about freedom. We've got to think about reason. We have to think about truth, beauty, and also social cohesion, national identity, and the rights of not just the oppressed groups, but also groups that may historically have been advantaged. They have rights too. And I think we have to sort of optimize amongst all of those groups rather than simply maximizing outcomes for groups that are denoted as oppressed or historically disadvantaged. Well, if you look at history, what do you see when this has happened in a culture? I don't know if Mao's China is a, a good proxy. Uh, you know, what would be a, one or more historical examples that you think we could learn from and that would point to where this is going? Well, I think you're right about Mao's China and the sort of phenomenon of a kind of not, not as much, I mean, not so much a state led, but more of a kind of bottom up. And you saw that a bit in post Khrushchev Soviet Union. It was all about you were taken to the gulag and shot, but you lost out on the opportunity of having a dacha or of having a good job and or having a position and when somebody sort of ratted on you, you know. And so I think there's this kind of culture of sort of bottom up emergent authoritarianism where 
peers, on social media, putting pressure on your employers uh, to punish you, to trying to sort of ostracize you. And these kinds of bottom-up pressures can restrict your liberty, can distort the truth. You know, what is, I'm from Canada, right now there is kind of an official civil religion which is based around a lie, which is really about that the Native Indian residential schools committed genocide against their pupils, and there is not a shred of evidence for it. These, and yet, this seems to be a, a sort of lie that is going unchallenged within the media, within the political class. And so I think we're going to get certain untruths that aren't really addressed, and we're also going to get a distortion of the what um, Jonathan Rauch calls the truth-based order in his book, The Constitution of Knowledge, whether that's the law, whether that's the merit-based order, whether that's universities in terms of, or in corporations in terms of what merit is. You know, that sort of truth-based order is under threat from this ideology, I would argue. What do you think is going to happen demographically, for instance, to uh, you know various countries in the West, the U.S., Europe, Australia, the UK? This may harken back to your, your White Ships book, but what do you see as a demographic change over the next few years? Well, I think all of these countries are can be encapsulated within the second demographic transition argument that there's no longer a link between sex and procreation. It becomes a choice. Once it's a choice, it's driven less by economic necessity of having hands to work the land or it's much or, or provide for you in your old age. The government can do that or you, you can do that. Uh, so it's much more cultural. And so cultural values are going to be much more determinative in who has higher fertility. Now, of course, we're in a, the Western world as well as East Asia, where you have very low below fertility, below replacement fertility. We've had it for 40 years, which means absolute numbers of absolute populations are declining were it not for immigration. Of course, immigration, however, is only a kicking the can down the road because immigrants age and have a low replacement fertility too. I would say I would expect a continued decline. We've seen in the Anglo countries really a drop in total fertility rates over the past 10, 20 years. Britain, it's dropped from something close to replacement to around 1.55 in about 10, 12 years. And so I think that's been a kind of a newer trend. Scandinavia has slipped down. It used to be around replacement. It's gone down. Really, it's only France that looks like it's pretty solidly close to replacement, not to mention Israel, of course. And I would expect that to continue because of later ages of marriage and ex the rise of continued expressive individualism. And so that will lead to, yeah, I think more of a, a pressure on yeah, pensions and debates over how we want our societies to look in the future. Okay. Any trends that I know you have suspicions about, but you don't know, there's not enough data, but I know the trends that you're, you're thinking about coming in the next X number of years, which of them do you think are going to be, I don't know, maybe the most culturally important of all? Well, I think this culture war between cultural socialism on the one hand and what seems to be a new coalition of cultural liberals and cultural conservatives. So liberals who might have been in the left camp, say, in the 60s because they supported free speech, for example, and objective truth, perhaps against religion. They are swinging, or I would argue to some degree swinging towards the conservatives because of the, the power of cultural socialism and organization. So I think that and that will continue because these are we have got to come up with some kind of an accommodation between these two things. The way we did between socialism, communism, capitalism, we came to an accommodation with mixed capitalism. We have to come to that accommodation in the culture, I think. And so I would see that these the issues you're seeing around critical race and radical gender theory in schools, diversity training in organizations, and I think increasingly affirmative action as well, speech, cancel culture issues, all of that I think is going to grow and become more important in electoral politics across all Western countries. And we've seen it now emerging in Britain, we've seen it emerging in Canada, and I think now that as well as the Russian issue will continue to be a very live one, I think, because it's so central to the kind of ethno-demographic shifts that are, are taking place. You know, people know about the U.S. going from about 85% non-Hispanic white in 19 1960 to around 50%, around 2050. That kind of process is occurring also at the same speed in Quebec. It's occurring in Canada and New Zealand are going to be around 50%, sort of p passing that majority minority point around the same time. And then Western Europe, it's the, towards the end of the century. But in all cases, I, these issues aren't going anywhere. And so definitely we're going to see the the fault lines be more cultural, I think, in election, electoral politics. So that realignment from the old left-right economic free market versus uh, socialism, shifting more towards this kind of open, closed, globalist, nationalist, whatever you want to call it, cultural cleavage, which I think will define politics going forward.
So that's kind of the way I see it. Now, I mean, there are some very long term trends if you want to talk about on the demography side, which are more wild cards that we could think about. You said on the demography side, what kind of wild cards? Um, I mean, I would guess that the U.S. seems like there's a huge Latino influx. I would think our demographics will shift in that direction, but it won't be from, let's say, the people that have been here a while, but more from new immigrants. It seems like immigration is incredibly powerful to reshape countries, but what what are your thoughts from your perspective? It is because, particularly now where the U.S. has a low at native, you know, the U.S.-born people have a lower fertility rate, whereas in, you know, in the 1890s to the, to the 1920s when the foreign-born share was arguably not that different, but the sort of native-born birth rate was much higher, so the impact was less and it faded away more quickly. Whereas now what you have is you've got a relatively low birth rate, so those ethnic changes are more magnified. Now, yeah, I mean, Latinos will continue to rise as a share of the population. However, their birth rates have come down a lot. So that will take some of the steam out of their growth rate. You know, I think Asians are the fastest growing immigrant group. So we're going to see that kind of ethnic change occurring, definitely. But there are also some other other issues around particularly religious demography. We know that people who attend church, for example, regularly have around a replacement birth rate. Those who are who say they have no religion and don't attend are getting close to one child per couple. So you've got a big uh, birth rate differential there, which which is going to start to tell, you know, in demography, we always say if you do these projections, the fertility rate differentials matter in the long term, whereas the switching behavior and the sociological uh, stuff matters in the shorter term. So longer term, I think those sorts of religious demography are going to matter. And also there's this kind of question, you know, where you have countries now like Korea with a fertility rate of 0.8 East Asian, a lot of East Asian countries are really, really low. What Some people argue that, you know, in an age of contraception and in an age when culture and values determine whether you have larger families, genetics could start to matter. So if you have a gene for liking kids or wanting families, you know, it could be that, that we're going to see those genes selected for. And so maybe in the long, long, long run, that the people who are still around are going to be those who carry those genes. I mean, that's a theory and there is some data behind it. But and the other one, of course, is is from my 2010 book that religious communities are going to gradually become larger, become the dominant force in Western populations. So, you know, if you just run the math, there will be something like 300 million Amish in the 2200s in the U.S. So that, of course, something could happen and maybe they will stop growing, but they've been keeping up their growth rate for 100 years. And similarly, uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Hutterites and other groups like that may become a much more important part of the population in maybe a century or two than now. Okay. Well, very good. Eric, where can people find out more about your work and which book, you know, if they're going to jump into your ideas, which would be maybe the first one that's the ACLM brand? Well, yeah, you can find uh, me on the internet, www.snepssneps.net. You know, the books that we've talked about, one is Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? This is if you're interested in the demography of religion and, and religious growth. The book White Shift that I wrote in 2018 is more about populism and the rise of populism as a result largely of ethnic shifting in Western countries. And then I've got a new book out, which is maybe going to come out in February, possibly May 2024, which will be on the culture wars and the rise of cultural socialism or wokeness. So yeah, whichever uh, strikes your fancy, I encourage you to, to check it all out. And I'll be announcing a lot of that on my website. I'm also on Twitter at EPKAUFM. Okay. Well, very good. Eric, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me, uh, Richard. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.